Hello, and welcome to Reed Scholars Live. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Fleming, current president of Reed Scholars. Today, I'm excited to have three guests with me from the class of 2000. So this will be our first panel podcast. So bear with us if we have any uh, technical glitches along the way. But I'm super excited uh, about having these three ladies on today. They are uh, nothing short of phenomenal and inspirational and definitely epitomize what the fellowship is about. Um, in their work, and they are all entering or shortly entering or have entered new roles in the past few months. So they're going to give us some more information about that. So these introductions will be very brief so that we can talk about that uh, in a little bit more depth during the podcast. So first we have Dr. Kimberly Weish, who will be the new Senior VP for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at ASHTHO. We also have Dr. Dora Hughes, who is a Senior Advisor at CMS and Dr. Tamara Brownlee, who is the Chief Health Officer at Accenture. Welcome, how are you doing, ladies? Doing wonderful. Doing great. Good. Um, so why don't we start with Dr. Kim? So also, we usually ebb and flow between first names, last names, all of that. So don't, whatever you wanna call me is fine. <laughs> during the course of the podcast. Um, but I know, Dr. Kim, you are um, looking forward to a new role here soon, but I usually like to start the conversation with a little bit of a, a historical perspective and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, because you're actively working at this moment, right? Um, and your uh, journey to health equity. So just share with us whatever you'd like to, like to let the listeners know. Oh, well, let's see. Well, as you can see, I'm currently in clinic, uh, living in the intercept between public health and between medicine as an assistant professor here at Meharry Medical College in the Department of Pediatrics, as well as in a division of public health practice. So I spend the majority of my time teaching um, medical students and public health students around the public health, which includes issues of uh, race, issues of diversity, issues of health disparities, health equity, et cetera, as a way to try to make them, make at least the medical students um, a little bit more well-rounded, also teaching health coaching for them as a way of improving communication skills with them. Um, when I'm not doing that, my research interests focus mostly on adolescent girls around resiliency and how do high achieving girls survive in low performing schools. So doing a lot of work in, in that realm. Also, my passion has been infant mortality, maternal mortality as the PI for one of the federal Healthy Start grants as a subcontract for the medical and clinical. We do group prenatal care and group pediatric care, which is something special there. And I'm at work now because as a result of seeing a lot of my adolescent patients with high hemoglobin A1Cs, we've started a um, Be Well clinic where I've gathered up my kids. Um, we're doing nutrition education, some movement and health coaching along with just regular check-ins as a way to try to make sure that they don't convert into being diabetics. So um, I think that's a, a just a brief overview of, of <laughs> <You gotta do laughs> what, what I do on a daily right? basis. <laughs> so later we'll talk about when do you sleep, but we'll save that for a little bit later. <laughs> sleep is overrated. <laughs> Um, we can go on to, I think I'm going to call you Dr. Dora. I'm going to call you Dr. Tam, Dr. Dora, and Dr. Kim today. I think that's where I'm going. So Dr. Dora, tell us about um, your evolution and what brought you to this. Uh, that, and we'll talk about what got you to this position next. Uh, thank you. And thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in the podcast. It's always exciting to, to have this conversation with such a group of uh, dynamic women. Um, currently, uh, I am the senior advisor at the Center for Medica Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, also known as CMMI, or the Innovation Center at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, I just started in my job five weeks ago, so I am uh, <laughs> certainly quite new, but this is um, not my first time in federal government. Um, as, it, as the incoming uh, chief medical officer at CMMI, um, I was asked to, to lead on health equity uh, and as well as to advise on the clinical affairs, clinical implications of our models. And for those of you who are newer uh, to the Innovation Center, we are, I like to describe us as an experimental arm of CMS. We house a lot of demonstrations, pilots, we call them models, and they focus on care delivery, they focus on payment innovation, focus on population health. 
Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to impact health equity uh, and to uh, reduce disparities among the Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries who participate in our models. Uh, and so it certainly has been very exciting to, uh, to dive deep and start to work on many of these issues, as well as to bring uh, the population health, public health focus to uh, CMMI, which CMS, as many of you know, is uh, the uh, main uh, funder, public funder um, in the United States, housing the Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP programs. With that, I'll hand the mic over to Dr. Tam. Absolutely. Hey, everybody. It's so good to be in the room with uh, some people I admire so much, um, and, and we go way back. Um, pleasure to be with all of you. I am Tamara Duperval Brownlee, but over the years, it's just easier to call me Tam Brownlee, and I serve as the Chief Health Officer for Accenture. Accenture is uh, one of the nation's uh, actually global uh, largest professional services firms, uh, otherwise known as a consulting firm, and um, I've been six weeks going on seven on the ground in my post, and it's a uh, it's, uh, a unique opportunity, I will say, to look after and advance the health, safety, and well-being of a very unique um, population of people across the globe. Accenture um, is currently in about 50 countries uh, throughout the globe, and they have uh, professional services in the areas of technology, strategy, and consulting, um, cloud-based services, interactive, um, and they also provide a number of front and back office uh, services for many of the large uh, corporations that we know of, both here in the US and internationally. My role is actually an inaugural role for Accenture, and um, it came out of, as I understand it, uh, really a need um, that's really being seen in the corporate landscape in America where the companies are really wanting to be more responsible um, in terms of how they are caring for people who work for them um, and really putting, I think, some real tangible effort and investment towards what do programs for health and safety really mean. Why it was attractive for me, I think at this point in my career was um, about impact. The um, Accenture universe, we have about 600,000 employees throughout the globe with uh, large populations within the United States as well as India. And um, in my global, or in my health equity journey, I've always been interested and wanted to look for that opportunity where I'd be able to impact uh, health populations globally. Uh, so this was a real exciting opportunity for me. Um, in the past seven weeks, uh, as you might imagine, most as most of our roles have been uh, uniquely focused, it's been about COVID, COVID and, and more COVID, um, but also interestingly, about um, addressing the acute mental health needs of talented people, you know, who work and have had to also be caregivers and, um, you know, uh, teachers all of a sudden and, uh, you know, another level, I think, of even performers on their job and, and addressing crisis, I think, among workers now and ensuring that we can do our best to make sure people feel cared for. So I'm, I'm excited and I can't wait to hear more from from my uh, fellow panelists. And speaking to, now that we've kind of have a general idea of what people are doing, I think one of the strengths, of course, of the fellowship is that you have the opportunity to do so many things. So we all start as physicians or dentists, but then we grow into wherever our path is gonna take us. And so we've talking about clinical medicine, academia, uh, government services, and the corporate space. So I often try to tell people when we talk about health equity on the on the podcast that it's not about the health care you get right at the, at the at the clinical level uh, solely that we have to kind of have this more broad approach. So if each of you could just kind of speak to um, to that point on why it's important to tackle health equity from every angle, and we touched on it a little bit, um, but just kind of go into a little bit for more details. People are for those who are just kind of learning in the space. Well, I can say that the, the journey for health equity has been one that is um, just very fulfilling from the sense of learning from the fellowship and learning all the, the public health components of um, 
really care in a, in a larger context. And then taking that and for my journey, taking it to the public health department, um, where I was able to impact uh, populations of mothers and babies, um, school age children and adolescents and taking that knowledge and then trying to give back as far as doing the academic medicine and teaching the next generation some of the, the skills, some of the leadership traits that we have learned as fellows. And then from the, we'll say the bumps and bruises from experience. And so then having that as far as being this next role um, in the role as senior uh, VP for health equity and diversity um, initiatives with, with ASTO is an opportunity to again, now take this to another level to have influence at the national level with the health officers, um, but also still figuring out ways to, to reach back and bring up this next generation of leaders so that as the kind of the, the way the fellowship works to continue to put people or to prepare people to be put in places to be influencers so that we continue this journey on how do we make a sustainable change. And one way to do that is by changing the landscape. And we change the landscape by changing the people that are in the landscape. I like it. Pam, why don't you go next so we can mix up the order? Absolutely, have to. I think Kim said that so well. She dropped a mic there, um, you know, in terms of the importance of, of changing the landscape. I guess I, I probably frame an answer to say um, that it, for me, it started with um, a North Star, you know, and I think that um, were this to be, a, you know, a message to those who are junior just starting in their journey um, as uh, healthcare professionals and wanting to find their place in uh, impacting health equity and advancing health equity for whatever population you're interested in is uh, make sure you know for yourself what your North Star is. And I think the opportunities as they present themselves, you can pressure test against, you know, whether or not it feeds, you know, what your vision is for what you hope to do um, and, uh, and continue to advance your, your North Star. I think it was the fellowship that helped actually give me words to understand what my North Star was to say, um, you know, that being a family physician who was very passionate about treating populations that were marginalized and made vulnerable, um, it was all about ensuring that people were enabled to live healthy and well, just that simple. You know, initially it started off with ensuring that they had access to care. So working in, in my first job out fellowship was uh, with a federally qualified health center and with an academic medical center. And that was important because I wanted to hone my skills as a physician. So I did full service family medicine uh, during that time. I taught students and residents and uh, built, I think, a agenda for advocacy, um, especially rooted around, um, around access. Uh, not long after I started as an attending, that's when the Affordable Care Act was signed, which was momentous. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it really changed a lot even for impact for me. After, um, after that journey for about a decade, I realized um, that I wasn't fulfilled, you know, uh, in terms of what my North Star was and, and, and particularly in the environment where I was. So I left myself open to what the next opportunity it was. Um, it ended up being in another state, still working for a community health center. Um, and I think the lesson there was just being open to what, um, when opportunities come. I, I had set myself out to be a Joe Blow physician, um, but within a short period of time, uh, stepped into leadership. And I think that's the other uh, critical thing that um, we're, we're all prepared to go into roles of leadership. And I think being able to seize those moments so that we can do all the things that Kim just talked about, you know, advancing agendas, you know, changing the culture and perhaps the environment and the table so that we can further advance the issues of health equity was important. Um, along the way, I think, um, again, I kept asking the question, how much impact am I having? Um, and I think my next pivotal move was to a healthcare system um, where I was really able to say and be at a leadership table um, and challenge really uh, a well-established organization to say, we are mission driven to take care of the poor and vulnerable, but where are we actually doing that outside of our charity dollars? You know, how are we looking and stratifying the people that we take care of, the 2 million people we take care of throughout the, 
the country and even the care of our 160,000 associates across the nation. Um, and that seven year journey, nearly seven year journey was probably the most trying <laughs> for me um, in that respect and um, probably produced the most results, you know, in terms of being able to not only give an organization language about health equity, but us to be able to perform against it, eliminate disparities um, and even, um, cultivate equity beyond the clinical space um, so that we could all move the agenda together. I'm really excited about what I can do at Accenture. And my, my focus is still on health equity. I think about it for our 600,000 people. I think about their families, the communities that we impact, and even in our health practice, as we are advising healthcare systems and providers and and payers, you know, are you looking at health equity as you are building new systems, even cloud migrations for um, solutions for your organizations? So the future is bright. It could be anywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, just be open, but, but definitely know what your North Star is. So uh, I, all of the points by Dr. Kim and Dr. Tam are, are really resonating with me, I, I think. Um, I particularly the concept of the North Star. Uh, when I first joined the fellowship, I admittedly, I had an interest in minority health and health disparities as we described it back then. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what policy was and I just kind of wandered into the fellowship trying to, to, to learn about how to translate my interest into uh, the broader uh, policy community influencing as Kim would say, how to, um, voice for, for, for those that uh, weren't at the table. Um, I started my journey in philanthropy. I was able to uh, join the Commonwealth Fund, working in their quality of care for underserved patient populations starting out. Uh, after a few years, I kind of veered, I was, I was about to say I veered right, but I, I veered hard left uh, in Deputy Director for Health for Senator Ted Kennedy. And in the Senate at that time, and there was some uh, major legislation, Medicare Part D was going through, but there's a whole host of bills that you hear less about that dealt with medical training, it dealt with providers, it dealt with um, uh, children. And I was also the lead staffer on a major um, um, uh, minority health bill, uh, the Healthcare Equality and Accountability Act, as we called it, a 450 page behemoth uh, that um, uh, this really didn't pass, but it really served as kind of a uh, uh, putting a stake in the ground for what many of the congressional offices uh, cared about and the priority uh, expressed within on behalf of many Democratic offices. Um, after that, I was able to join Senator Barack Obama's office, and that was certainly uh, uh, another just pivotal moment for me, being able to join the campaign and join his administration at HHS. And really now, of course, I'm coming full circle as I left HHS, but now I'm back in the federal government. It really helped to highlight the extraordinary impact you can have as a federal official through the regulation, regulatory process, through programs, through policies, um, the way you can just impact millions of Americans uh, in all walks of life by uh, focusing on access, focusing on coverage, focusing on quality, uh, and now increasingly focusing on population health. Um, uh, we, um, even though I started when I was HHS before, more on the public health and science side of the shop, working closely with my colleagues at CDC and NIH and HRSA uh, and NIH now at CMS, it's more on the health financing side of the shop. But really trying to bridge those two worlds together and think about through our models, how are we addressing public health? How are we addressing the social determinants of health? How are we addressing social needs of our of our of our, of our beneficiaries? It's a uh, it's a just a very uh, new paradigm of caring, thinking about the human services along with the health services um, that our patients need. Um, and I and even though after I left HHS, I went to consult for a while. I went to GW for a while. Uh, throughout, I always worked on minority health. Um, but being back at uh, CMS has really just allowed me again to expand um, uh, the impact of my work and it's just extremely rewarding and I would encourage all of my colleagues hopefully to spend some time in, in federal service uh, because in my view there's just no substitute uh, in terms of the, the magnitude of the impact that you can have. And so in, in thinking about 
each of your evolution through your leadership journey, right? You've done lots of different things. You've had to interact with lots of different people. Um, and you're also a human being outside of your job, right? So you're balancing family life and um, personal life and with your leadership responsibilities. So it, would you mind sharing a little bit, one, about um, how do you negotiate the leadership la landscape when sometimes you're the only one uh, or you are uh, presenting new uh, and different ways of thinking and, and asking people to change the culture of an organization? Um, and then two, as much as you want to share about not taking that home with you, right? And how do you still make time for friends, family, and other responsibilities? Oh boy, I don't know if you should ask that question. <laughs> is there balance? There's no balance. What? Balance. Or, maybe not. Just sure. speak for but, no, there's no balance ever. And so what I think it is it mission impossible. This is your mission if you fix that. Um, and so, and all of us have in the fellowship, um, there are sacrifices, certainly personal, family, um, uh, but um, but at some point you become at peace with uh, knowing that, you, that you're doing what you can do, um, and um, and uh, and your house is never clean. But aside from that, um, but I I think you, I mean I think that's just a really critical point. It is in many cases I think probably true for all of us. We have been the only person in the room, or or trying to think how do you become effective. Uh, without without your village, uh, without having a, a deep bench of people behind you, and and I find that uh, even being back in federal service, I'm often kind of the one that squeaky well that says, "What about what about?" Uh, because I take my role as leading on health equity very seriously, and so um, reminding individuals that we, as part of our work, we are to. Uh, think about the whole range of populations. And so not being afraid to talk about racial and ethnic populations, mm. not being afraid to talk about people with disabilities. And what about those in rural areas and um, uh, those that need language assistance? I mean, really putting, being very clear and intentional about our work, uh, which is not uh, um, the same level of priority at the Innovation Center before. Mm. Uh, done some work and we know that many of our models uh, uh, are, we're primarily serving white beneficiaries and those that were higher income. Uh, and so how do we, how do we re pivot and making sure that we are broadly as inclusive as possible and that we are, are really um, uh, living out the ideals of health equity, you know, attaining the highest potential for all people. So that's, it's a, uh, at times it's hard, but I will have to say though, even though sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm the only one, I, it's always surprising the support you have in quiet quarters and who really help uh, enable um, enable your work and to uh, just really provide this support. And so, and so certainly I would also say that even 20 years out, how many years out are we now? I, 21 years. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah. it's incredible the extent to which I still rely on this network, um, not just for support, although as critical as that is, but also, frankly, for expertise and, and guidance and wisdom. And so I uh, think that I it's all so many ways can track down my success and my career, my satisfaction, and in so many ways tracks back to the fellowship and, and Joan Reed's leadership. So I remain forever grateful for um, for for all of you <laughs> and uh, and just our collective impact together has been staggering. So um, I'll, I don't know who, who's- I'll um, jump in. I, I uh, thank you, Dora. I think um, I would just amplify actually a couple of points you made. Um, certainly um, has some interesting and unique experiences being an only, being an only woman, being an only person of color and, um, you know, just being who I am, more introverted, a bit more introspective. I, I always felt like a fish out of water, you know, uh, in these particular spaces. Um, and what's helped me, um, certainly growth, you get some wins under your belt and people, you get attention, that that helps. But something Dora said about um, 
taking a, a opportunity to step back, maybe survey the agora, you know, or the balcony and look for those people who are actually helpful and supportive, you know, um, and how important they are for you to be able to advance an agenda and um, you, employing them to amplify a direction that you're having or introducing a point of view that wasn't traditionally a part of an organization, I think is game changing. Um, Another perspective is as a person who's been in leadership pretty much since I left the fellowship, I have not had a leadership role since then. And it's tough. You know, I think uh, anybody who would uh, confess that, you know, it's easy, all you need is ambition and, and the like is just talking out the side of their neck, as we used to say in, in Chicago. But, um, you know, the truth is, it is a balance. There is sacrifice. There is, you know, moments that are hard. Um, the upside, and I say this as a leader, is that the more that you're able to um, do those things that build resilience and uh, restoration and care for yourself and allow yourself to be authentic to the people you lead and the people you lead alongside, does so much more for you to be effective as a leader when the stuff goes down um, than um, always putting on the cape, you know, so to speak, um, in that res respect. I think about all the things, you know, in the past 20 years, 21 years uh, since we left fellowship and, you know, we've seen family death, we've seen major illness, we've seen cancer, you know, infertility, so many things, you know, and, and for me, it's being, it was just being honest and saying like, you know what, now I'm not good right now. <laughs> you know, I'm still supporting the needs of this organization. I still believe in health equity um, and uh, we're going to advance it, but the team will, you know, at this moment um, and being able to call on friends, you know, in the fellowship, I can't, I can't count on two hands, more than two hands, how many people I've actually collaborated with, asked for advice, had speak, you know, uh, in the fellowship to help amplify that. And I think that's really critical um, in looking at both the agenda of leading in health equity as well as uh, balancing leadership also. Kim, what would you say? Let's see, I'm still trying to figure out where that balance is. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping by the time you got around to me, I would have figured that out. But uh, it's <laughs> a trigger that, question. <laughs> it is a trick question. Um, you know, these these two ladies, as far as kind of rounding out um, the class of the knots, the, the class of not oh, oh, um, were truly part of that inspiration and part of the uh, part of being able to tolerate the the role of being the only one is knowing that there's this quiet army. Uh, behind you and the underground railroad of the fellowship that you can kind of just kind of step in and say, hey, anybody have this, a connection with this? What about this? Have you had this experience? And really being able to utilize that, that strength um, and those, those, you know, those, those experts. I think that by the time you get to this part in your career, you know, 21 years out, geez, until you said that I hadn't calculated it, I'm glad y'all you know, stay young. Um, this idea that if, if you know who or what you're really working for, then everything else is, is, you know, just momentary, the ups and the downs, the ebbs and the flows, they come and they go. And at this point, you have enough um, well healed wounds, we'll say that it's like, you know, so what are you gonna do? <laughs> you gonna hurt me? Eh, been there, done that, done her anymore. You know, you gonna fire me? Eh. Been there, done that. You're going to cut me off at the knees? You know, I've been there, done that. So at this point, with the um, support of the fellows, you know, you can always fall down, but there's always this, this quiet army that's going to lift you back up and remind you that the work you're doing, you're doing for the right reason. And as long as you know why you're doing it, then it makes the, the uh, trials and tribulations um you know more worth it and um that also kind of helps with the with some of the the imbalance in there <laughs> because again you know that you're working towards a common goal um and although you may be the only one in the room you're not the only one in the fight and as a unit or together we'll be able to to get there um you know, kind of like the, you know, the famous Martin Luther King. I don't know when we're going to get there. May not be there with you, <laughs> but they're enough for the fellows uh, to keep it going. 
of it. May not be the only one in the room. It may be the only one in the room, but not the only one in the fight. Um, so as we close, so we, uh, of course, now these past 18 months have been a, a roller coaster of a year for lots of different reasons. And with all of the tragedy, um, political strife and, and everything in between, we've also had also an opportunity for innovation and, and collaboration and really growth and we um, tackle tough health equity and social justice issues. So I usually like to end with just a little reflection of um, what you're looking forward to as we go forward or any words of wisdom um, for people who might be having a little bit of trouble right now um, dealing with the weight of everything that's going on. So um, I'll let you all just decide who goes first. Y'all doing good at that part, so. <laughs> you know, when you said that, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, as a as a pediatrician, you know, is you know finding Nemo and Dory and saying, "Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming." <laughs> and as you just keep swimming, eventually, you know, we'll get there. The last eighteen months have been hell in a handbag, um, but it's one day at a time. Um, and as Tim said, between the losses, the gains, the disappointments, the fights and everything else like that, um, make you a stronger person. And again, knowing that if you fall, there is, you know, you will be lifted back up by the network. You know, it's one day at a time. I should go next. Um, so Dr. Tam can finish with her um, eloquent spiritual high notes that she's uh, equally capable of delivering. Uh, it has been very tough. I, and I love, that, I love that you mentioned this. I, I love also that you're creating the space for vulnerability. Um, I think for me, there's so much going on that, it's, that it just feels completely out of my control that in some ways, it really helped to sharpen my focus on things that were within my control. And so how do you focus on your family? And what are, what are you doing at work? If there's no balance, as we've all said, then what do you want? How do you want to spend your day? What type of work do you want to do? Um, and really letting that be your anchor in some ways uh, has been helpful. Um, being very clear how you're contributing um, to to public good uh, and doing your part. And so sometimes uh, even just it's, it can seem to be so overwhelming and, and so much of what we're doing is divorced from the, the issues, um, knowing that, um, that, that you are part of the fight uh, and that you can help uh, it, has been kind of helpful for me uh, as with all the chaos swirling around. So I don't know if that's the best answer, but, uh, but it is just, again, just a reminder, do your part, do something, um, and, and stay anchored um, to, to the issues that we all care about. So bring us home, you know. <laughs> Dora, that was brilliant. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> Here I go. That's her no, role. Um, <laughs> Dora, that was brilliant. I, I, I actually couldn't have said that better. Um, there's, there is something to just having, you know, hurricane swirling around you and you have this just intense focus on what matters most. And um, I would amplify actually that message. In the past uh, year and a half plus, you know, I, we've talked about the COVID pandemic, we've talked about this um, social justice awakening that's happened. Um, I would probably say that there is probably a um, a burgeoning pandemic when it comes to the care of people and their mental health and state. And it's in part losing a little bit of elasticity related to looking at all that's happening around us and not being able to do anything about it. Um, and the importance of actually having a focus and a moment to say, I'm not okay right now. I need to take care of myself. Um, it'd be purposeful and intentional about what it will take for you to refill your cup and then channel that positivity and that recovery into doing what you're put on this planet for um, is probably the best thing that I would say. I remember um, I was 
in church, actually, probably March of last year, probably the last time I was in person, you know, at church. And uh, my pastor had me and a few others as part of a panel to kind of talk about, hey, this pandemic is coming. What should we expect? And I was just like, I don't know, but I think it's going to be bad. A, I think it's going to be a while before we get out of it. B, but on the other side, for those of us who are able to say, okay, I'm going to do these things to make sure I'm hearing, I'm listening, you know, and uh, focus on what I'm here for. Should I survive? We'll actually see increase. They will see promotion. They will see gains. And I think that's true. Um, you know, even despite all the badness, you know, that we've seen and how it's impacted us closely, if you're still here, um, you gained you know, in that respect. And I think hold on to that. And especially in the wealth of the network and, and what I've been able to certainly hear and glean from Dr. Kim and, and Dr. Dora and, and also you, Dr. Mary. So um, that that's 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 my my piece, I guess, to it that, you know, keep going um, and, and your purpose, I think, will, will guide you. Thank you so much, ladies. I think um, just to to echo what each of you just said what i heard was honor the space that you in uh, stay true to your purpose take one day at a time um, and leave the things that you can you can't control over there so just honor what you can do um, with the space that you've been given and with this space i am so thankful um, and honestly several times i got chills listening to you all speak i'm very very humbled that you took the time to talk with me today I'm also very humble that you are the leaders that you are. So um, those of us that are not falling too far behind in your footsteps, we won't talk about how long I've been out of the fellowship, um, have something to aspire to and have somebody to lean on. And I think like you each said, one of the most important things about the fellowship, but any support network is that you lean on that network as you need it. Um, and really, you know, try to check in with yourself and, and ask for what you need when you're in the space. Um, that you might need something that's, that's outside of what's going on in your own life right now. So with that, I will thank you again. I appreciate your time. Um, and I will surely be talking to all of you soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Mary. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you for listening to Reese Powers Live. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or subscribe to our YouTube channel.